Other man, um, they are they are making me signals that I don't they don't have sound from me. Okay, good. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, I want to start with this: how um, the corn and the modern hybrids are responding to increase increments in planting densities. If we look at this graph that contains information from whole U.S. and Canada, this is how much the response to uh, incre increases in planting density has been over, I would say, the last 30 years. Uh, in 1985, uh, at a planting density of 23,000 seeds per acre, the average yield was 105 bushels. Uh, when they look at <coughs> uh, 2011, and they were using 30,000 seeds per acre, the average yield was 160. So the rate, the yield, the rate of yield increase per year um, based on in increases um, on planting density has been two bushels per year. And I'd like to thank also my colleagues by uh, introducing and the, the comparison of all hybrids and modern hybrids. Why we can increase yield uh, by increasing uh, planting density with the hybrids that we have today. <clears throat> so and this graph is, is really, I, I like it because it's really explaining what's happening with our modern hybrids when we increase planting density and what happened if we use, let's say, all hybrids uh, and we try to increase uh, planting density. Uh, sometimes we we don't don't like to take risk 
and we try to perhaps stick with what we know, with, what, with the things that we used to do as far as management. But now we have uh, hybrids with new genetics, hybrids that has been selected under perhaps some stress conditions. And that's why they are performing much better and they are providing a much higher response to increases in planting density like this graph is showing. So the genetics on the new hybrids, especially improvements in stress tolerance, especially at high planting density, allow those hybrids to yield more than all hybrids. But I'd like to also to point out that not every hybrid is going to have the same response to increases in planting density, and my colleagues were showing that uh, earlier. Why, what is happening with those plants when we increase density? What are the physiological changes, changes that are occurring? One of them, and my colleagues uh, mentioned this, is light interception. Higher light interception is occurring as a result of higher leaf area as the population increases. Uh, I, I remember when I was looking at uh, preparing this talk, I remember my plots, and I remember how those corn plants in the plot with the higher planting density was looking in relation to the lower planting density. The leaves were much more upright on the higher planting density than on the lower planting density. So more upright leaves enhances photosynthetic rate near the ear. Therefore, photosynthesis increases, then seed number increases. That's one of the reasons, because the, one of the ways the plant is compensating and is resulting into higher uh, yield. Studies in Minnesota uh, by, by, by these colleagues found that the maximum intersected photos photosynthetic active radiation, look at this, it was 95% occurred at the highest plant population tested, and they were testing 47,000. So those plants are at high, higher plant density were able to intercept much more light, that that's gonna result into energy, into carbohydrates. Uh, into and also increase uh, photosynthesis. There are some downsides of incre increases in plant population that we need to take into account, and one of them is the diameter of the stalks. When you increase the planting density, you will have plants with much smaller diameter, st stalk diameter, and that's gonna perhaps put your plants at risk for lodging. However, the modern, the new hybrid, the modern corn hybrids have much lower lodging percentage than the old hybrids. What else is happening with, with, this, with those plant densities uh, increments? In the past, as plant density increased, there was a big gap between the silking time and the flowering time, and you know that it has to be a synchronism between these two moments, okay? So, and that, when, when, they, when there was an increased silking, um, the, sorry, when the silking was delayed relative to antithesis, the pollination was reduced, so the final yield was impacted. Today, modern corn hybrids being bred for increased tolerance to stresses are showing a much narrow interval between silking and, and uh, flowering. So that is favoring uh, higher populations. So there is a much narrow time between these two events and synchronism. Um, the other studies have shown also an a impact on test weight when we increase uh, planting density and higher test, test way at higher planting densities. Uh, with that in, uh, background information, I would like to go into the results of these two tests that I told you. Uh, 
those tests were conducted, one in Fairhope, Alabama, South Alabama, and the other test was conducted or is being conducted in Prattville, Central Alabama. Uh, we, plan we started the Fairhope test in 2010, so we have more data. Uh, we started only two years ago uh, in Prattville. So what happening, what I have on these graphs here is on the x-axis, I have the planting densities that we were evaluating, and here is the yield, and the different uh, colored bars um, represent the two different planting dates that we were testing. Uh, those planting dates, we tended, we wanted to be one month apart. So the standard we were testing, the black bars represent the standard planting date at that location, and the hatch bar represent the, uh, uh, the, the corn that was planted a month later. That's what we wanted. Um, I want you to see two things. The first one is how different and how low the yield from 2011 was compared to 2012 and 2013. And some of my colleagues might say, Brenda, why you are you showing this? And I'm showing this is because I want, and you know that the risk that you take when you farm dry land. Okay, that's the first thing. There was no, there was no response, of course, to plant population under this condition. And they, no matter what, uh, you know, your density was, the plants were not responding. Why? There was no water. There was no water. And remember, we see, uh, my colleagues were pointing this thing out, we see a benefit or by increasing planting density, when we have some resources, if you have irrigation, yes, you will see a much more yield benefits. The sunlight, but then if there was no water there, there was not, there was no response. However, you see that we have much higher yield uh, when we delay the planting, and I will explain later why. When we look at uh, the data from 2012, data from 2013, and, and I will have a slide later on, the data from 2014, we see that there is an exponential increase in yield as we increase the planting density, even under those dryland conditions, okay? So, but then I would like to also, you see the yield increase as your plant density increase. The biggest question is, are are those significant differences, and are we making some money with those changes? If we look at 2012, this graph, no significant differences between the 20,000, uh, 22,000 rate compared to the 26,000 rate, and also there were no significant differences in yield between the 26,000 and the 36,000. However, there was a significant differences in yield between the 22,000 and the 32 and the 30,000. So there was a yield increase when I moved from, from 22,000 to 32,000 at that particular year, at that particular location. Let's look at the situation in 2013. You see that the, there, is a, there are differences in the way this, uh, this, uh, the corn response as in terms of planting date between these two years, okay? In 2012, there were not really significant differences between these two planting dates. You see that the bars are pretty much the same. But then when we look at 2013, the later planting day had much lower yield than the earlier or the standard planting date for that location. And when we planted this uh, test using the standard planting date, you see a much better response of increasing planting density than planting that crop later. And all of, those, all of that is related to water, to the rainfall distribution and the rainfall amount that we have during, that, during those critical periods of the growing season. I wanna show you a little bit of the weather data from these three years. 
This graph on the top represents the deviations. This zero line is the normal or the historic average of precipitation for those particular months. Okay, and the bars represent either precipitation that was below normal or below average, and the positive bars represent precipitation that was <coughs> above average. So let's look at 2011. That was this year where we have this terrible drought, and you see that all the precipitation, except for July, were above, <coughs> above average, below average. The same issue with 2012, but only on the months of March and April is where we have precipitation below <coughs> um, average. And then May and June, that are usually the months where we have, especially June, when silking occurred at that location, we have precipitation above average. So perhaps that's why, if we look at this bar, perhaps why, that's why the April 13th corn, perhaps a little bit better than the 20, uh, 20 of March corn, because during that year we have June precipitation, May precipitation um, above average. Okay, when we look at maximum temperature, this is another variable that is very important, uh, especially uh, during the silking and grain filling period. We, if we look at 2011, all the maximum temperature was almost above historic average for all that year. If we look at 2012, we have, precipit we have temper maximum temperature above um, historic average from March to May, and then it decreased from June to August. Those things might explain those differences also in yield. So here I'm summarizing the results in terms of the relations that I established, trying to explain those differences in yield, and I want to focus on the 2000, um, 2012 and 2013. In 2012, precipitation above average in May, June, and August, that was, that was what happened. Maximum uh, temperature below average from May to August, and this might explain the similarities between uh, the similarities in yield between these planting dates. Of course, the May and June precipitation in 2012 favoring uh, the later um, the later planting. If we look at 2013, that I want to contrast these two years and the in terms of the differences in response to planting date, precipitation above average temperature was observed between May to August, okay? So we have decent precipitation. When we look at maximum temperature, we have maximum temperature above average in the month of June. So <clears throat> I feel like a, that heat, during the May, during the month of June, really impacted <coughs> silking and a little bit of the grain development for this later planted uh, corn, the, the April 18. That's, that's, that's what I have, uh, what I think it, it happens. And then these are the results for 2014, and you see that these two graphs are very similar. So that means that these two years, really behave in a very similar fashion with the uh, early planting date or the standard planting date out yielding uh, or having higher yield than the later planting date. And also you see the response to increased uh, planting density. I would like to uh, move a little bit to the results uh, from Prattville. <clears throat> again, I have only two years of this test. And I want to point out again the differences or the impact that planting density have on your yield and planting they have on your yield. It's, I know it's difficult to follow and to know, <clears throat> you know, what the, what the weather conditions are going to be for the rest of the season when you plant your crop. You don't have much clue when you plant in March 
what's going to happen <clears throat> in June, uh, especially in this part of the country when we have this huge uh, variability in rainfall. But look at this is 2013, okay? And these are the differences in yield when I planted uh, um, at this location using the standard planting date compared to planting this crop a month later. But the situation was completely the opposite when, uh, when I look at my results from 2014. Again, all of this is related to, um, a lot of that was related to the distribution and amount of rainfall and the temperature between these two years. <clears throat> Um, again, if we look at uh, the response of uh, increased planting density at this particular location, this particular, these two years, <clears throat> you see that there was, uh, yes, an increase in planting density, in, in yield as we increase the planting density. Uh, in, in 2014, it's very interesting, the results, and we were just finishing processing the data uh, Few, few weeks ago, you see that there is a, a, a very distinctive variation between the low, the two low planting densities with respect to the two highest planting densities. You see that there was a much higher response to increase planting densities in 2014 than 2013 for that particular location. I want to move and I want to use perhaps the next three minutes uh, sharing with you the results from this year evaluating one of the pioneer Aquamax hybrids compared to one of the conventional hybrids. These results are from Fairhope and uh, the, I think the graph is very self-explanatory. The, the uh, black bars are the bars that represent the yield from the Aquamax hybrid, and the red bar represent the conventional hybrid that is not, uh, not being marked as drought tolerant. So look at the differences in yield. When I look at the 24,000 uh, seeding rate compared to the 28,000 seeding rate, so there was, just by looking only at the Aquamax uh, yield, there was no really much uh, yield increase when I compare these two seeding rates, okay? But when I look at 28,000 compared to 32,000, there was a 14 bushels uh, yield increase by increasing seeding rate for that particular um, hybrid. But it's also very interesting to see the yield differences between uh, each one of those seeding rates, when I look at the Aquamax hybrid compared to the conventional hybrid. So the, the, I, the, the uh, differences are really significant. What is causing, what is driving those changes in yield, those differences in yield, not only by planting density, but also between these two hybrids? And I highlighted here. Uh, so if we look at ear length, Okay, the, especially at the 28,000 and the 32,000, the Aquamax hybrid was much larger than the conventional hybrid. When we look at ear diameter, look at the differences in yield diameter between the Aquamax and the Pioneer 33 V14, okay? So bigger ear diameter, and when I look at the number of grains per ear, there was ma a larger number, a, a more uh, higher number of grains per ear coming from the Aquamax compared to the 33V14. Let's look at Pratview, and this, diff this data is similar to, uh, to Fairhope. You see the biggest and uh, the highest yield response from the Aquamax hybrid to increase uh, plant population compared to the 33B14 hybrid. Again, what was happening in Prattville, uh, so we saw a bigger ear diameter from the Aquamax hybrid, and we also saw a more 
a higher number of grains per area uh, coming from the, um, from the Aquamax hybrid, but only at the 20,000 uh, seeding rate and the 28,000 seeding rate. And that's all that I have for you. Um, I want to acknowledge um, the funding that I have received to conduct these two, uh, these two studies. And I forgot to include the logo uh, from Pioneer, but they have been very supportive also of those studies. And with that, I will be happy to take questions if you have. Okay?